you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the com. The Chris Voss Show dot com. Hey, we certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. We've got an amazing uh, author and guest on the show, and an astronaut, I should say. Uh, you're really excited to hear his story. He's written his uh, first book, memoir, that's come out on April 5th. 2022. Uh, in the meantime, go uh, subscribe to all the channels on the Chris Voss Show. Go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there in my books. Go to youtube.com, for chess Chris Voss, to see the video version of this. Our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram as well. Uh, the new book that just came out, as I mentioned, April 5th, 2022, Never Panic Early. And Apollo 13's Astronaut's Journey by Fred Hayes. He's going to be on the show today talking with us about what he did. And unless you've been living under a rock somewhere for the past 52 years, you haven't seen the Tom Hanks movies, uh, the different Apollo 13 movies and documentaries and just all the wonderful stuff that NASA has been doing all these years, uh, you should have heard about him. <laughs> he is a former U.S. Air Force and Marines Corps pilot and NASA astronaut, most famous for his role in the lunar module pilot for the nearly catastrophic Apollo 13 mission. Uh, he is an ex-fighter pilot and uh, selected for NASA's astronaut, astronaut program in 1966, served as backup for the lunar module for Apollo 8 and Apollo 11 missions, and uh, then he played a key role in NASA's space shuttle program after Apollo 13. Welcome to the show, Fred. How are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm over here in Houston. It's probably a little warmer here than where you are. Yeah, we had snow yesterday. Can you believe that? In Utah. We get, snow. We get snow about every uh, 14 years, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving to Houston next. Well, welcome to the show. We certainly appreciate you uh, coming. I mean, it's an honor. I grew up and I was born in 1968. I grew up looking at the black and white pictures of Neil Armstrong landing on the moon and just trying to figure it all out. I remember watching old people watching the old black and whites. Of course, I grew up on a black and white TV. Um, so it's an honor to have you here. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to join you and uh, hope we can talk a little bit uh my, as you mentioned, a lot, so much has been done uh, and written and the movies and uh, about Apollo 13. Uh, the book, uh, obviously, it's not focused entirely on that. Uh, so in fact, I think a couple of chapters about all I spend on Apollo 13 because and tried to work, work in a few things that maybe hadn't been covered before. There you go. Uh, is there any dot coms or places you want people to follow you on the interwebs? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Not, Time. Okay, so people can pick up the book where fine books are sold, pre-order it, or order it now. Uh, so, is this is this a, would you call this a memoir then of your life and experience? Uh, yes, yeah. It's, it starts with my uh, growing up and uh, born in Biloxi, Mississippi, and uh, in that period, I did, didn't just want to talk about my uh, experiences during that period, but also to give a flavor of uh, what life was like at those times and. Uh, what the economy was like with the, I talked to uh, pricing of things uh, and, and uh, it, uh, so it gives, gives a picture of how things have changed over the years. And you, you did, I mean, you've lived a life of historic precedence. You've, you've done a lot of things in your life. Uh, we'll, we'll even get into some of the, you had a plane crash at one point uh, where you were burned over 65% of your body, I believe. Um, you've, you've, you've been on a couple of adventures, sir. Yes, I, I have, and I've been very fortunate uh, because I'm now 88 years old, and uh, I'm still still here. Well, that's good. That's good. We're happy for that. So how, how did your life begin? How did you begin this journey, if you want to touch on that? Well, as I said, I, I was born in a small town, Biloxi, Mississippi, on the Gulf Coast. Uh, about 14,000 people when I was uh, born and raised, at least through elementary school. Uh, along came the World War II. That was the first dramatic change 
in that the particular area when uh, two airfields, uh, Kiesler Air Force Base and Gulfport uh, Base, was open during World War II, and all at once there was uh, uh, over 100,000 Army Air Corps airmen uh, now flooding the Gulf Coast, uh, including, including Biloxi, which uh, dramatically uh, changed the climate there. Uh, the uh, thing changed again uh, uh, later in life with the uh, growth of casinos. Mm-hmm. There's a very large uh, number of casinos all along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I think the square footage of the total number of those casinos probably equals uh, what you would find in uh, in New Jersey with the casinos uh, there, for the, as, at least the square footage. Mm-hmm. So that obviously has also changed the climate. It's no longer a sleepy little uh, 14,000 uh, population uh, town anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what shapes your life to where you, you got interested in, in working with NASA? What, what led you up to those sort of roads? Well, it, it, uh, it, what started me down that trail was uh, the Korean War. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had uh, wanted to serve my country, and my dad had recommended that I join something uh, that would lead to a commission, uh, officer's commission. And uh, at the time, with two years of college I had and 18 years old, the only program that fit uh, was the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. Uh, I had never flown uh, in an airplane, never been even sitting in an airplane on the ground. So uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't like many in the astronaut program I know talk about their youth and uh, they were so interested in flying and I was not, uh, and I so I was off on a different tangent. But uh, it was one of these things where the first time uh, Hank Chenard, my uh, flight, first flight instructor, took me up in an airplane, uh, it, it uh, just hit me right then that, boy, this is something. Right? And now my uh, life has changed. I'm no longer a journalist, which I was majoring in the first two years <laughs> of college. I'm going to be, it's going to be something in aviation. Now you have to realize that the time we're talking about is 1952. I went in and uh, there was no NASA. It was then NACA, which was doing a lot of testing, but strictly on aircraft uh, at the time at various NASA centers. Mm -hmm. So there was no NASA and there's no space program. And, but that, that started me uh, thinking about uh, what next uh, from being a Marine fighter pilot in two uh, marine fighter squadrons i served to uh become a test pilot mainly from reading books and i talked to a squadron commander ops officer and uh thought that would be uh, something to head toward next and looking at the requirements for the resume uh decided i needed to go back to school and mm-hmm. uh, finish uh, all, although with a degree in engineering Mm-hmm. And that's what I did next to the University of Oklahoma. Flew in the Air Guard, uh, Oklahoma Guard, while I was there. And uh, next decided uh, to uh, start applying. I applied to some companies, uh, but also uh, my squadron commander uh, recommended uh, when we first talked to NACA, N A C A. And uh, but by then it had ter- it become uh, in '58, I think it was. It became NASA. Mm-hmm. And the first uh, seven astronauts were chosen. So I did apply at several NASA centers and uh, was accepted at Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, which is now uh, named after John Glenn, Glenn Research Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The So was there something that appealed to you about, you know, flying flight or being a test pilot? Was, was there something that you really, you know, that really uh, captured your interest? Well, it was mainly being up uh, above and looking down at things and uh, <laughs> clouds. And uh, I mean, it's uh, even even from uh, low altitudes I was flying at at that time, although some of the jets I flew, you'd, you'd be at 40,000 feet or so. Uh, but it was uh, magical. And uh, I the, the test flying, uh, well, and the military flying was interesting. And the task I had, I was a fighter squadron, so and did a lot of uh Training, air ground support, uh, deploying weapons, bombs, rockets, uh, strafing, et cetera. And uh, I, I enjoyed that. And uh, testing was, as I looked forward to it, was, would be interesting because uh, particularly with uh, NACA or NASA as a research pilot, 
you would be using uh, airplanes and uh, not necessarily brand new airplanes, uh, but airplanes modified to test some new feature that would uh, add to increased performance of a particular aircraft uh, or safety. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, it was uh, going to be rewarding in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. I always love, I always love when you're flying an airplane, that first moment that the airplane, you know, gets taken up by the wind, you feel that movement and you're like, we're off the ground now. And then, like you said, the, you're over the clouds and you get, you get an impact that if only the Wright brothers could see what, what everything had become that they were dreaming of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible how far, really how far we've gone since those days you mentioned the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, le in less than a century, we were on the moon. Yeah, uh, spinning around. Yeah, who would ever, who would ever thought that? <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get a thrill from the experimental doing the experimental planes? I know that there's the danger there. Sometimes there's a lot of wrecks. Uh, well, there's, there's danger, obviously, in any flying. Uh, mm -hmm. Even airliners have troubles occasionally. Uh, but maybe, maybe uh, statistically a little more uh, because we were dealing with something, some case of modifications and trying out things that had not been tried out before. But uh, it's like uh, just as I, I did in the astronaut program, even in the aircraft test, we planned uh, uh, with a development of a test plan ahead of time, uh, not just uh, myself or the pilots, but with the uh, test engineers and those that were uh, sponsoring the program to figure out how we were going to approach it and uh, take it in, uh, say, smaller bites. Mm -hmm. So we didn't try to go too far too fast like Hollywood does in movies, uh, but to uh, approach it uh, from that aspect. And, and if available, look at the da data after each flight to see uh, what should we continue and how much further uh, and what we were, we pr were planning to do to be safe, uh, not just for ourselves, but for the uh, the aircraft, which themselves in a way were precious, because most of them uh, for that kind of a program and modifications done was kind of a one of a kind. Mm -hmm. so you, you obviously didn't want to, if you could help avoid it, uh, you didn't want to lose the aircraft either. Yeah, I, and, and this is at a time where there's a lot of stuff going on. Chuck Yeager, I think before you had, had uh, broken the speed of sound, I think. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yeah, Chuck. Chuck had, in fact, when I arrived, uh, transferred, I le left Lewis Research Center, or Glenn, and went to uh, Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base, where NASA had, I call it their mecca of flight test. Uh, X-15 program was going on. Unfortunately, I didn't ever get to fly it. And I did uh, go off for a year to a school, the ARPS, School, Aerospace Research Pilot School, uh, Air Force program. Uh, and Chuck Yeager was the commandant. He was the, uh, the boss uh, wow. of that school at the time. And uh, th that, was, that was a very good experience in my career. Mm -hmm. And then how do you transition into and to getting with NASA and, and of course, uh, preparing to become an astronaut? That's a whole new level of flying through the air. Well, uh, to me, for me, see, I was already a NASA employee, so it was just another transfer mm -hmm. to another center. In that case, it was Manned Spacecraft Center, which is now Johnson Spacecraft Center, named after President Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I had to apply just like uh, any, any, any of those who applied. NASA put out a notice for new applicants, and uh, I filled out a form that uh, you listed references and work and described work you were into and what you were doing and applied. And now the military had a little different process. Uh, they would apply within their services, be it the Air Force uh, or Marine Corps and, and, Navy, and Navy. And uh, they, the, the services themselves would choose from those that applied who they would give to NASA to pick. Mm -hmm. So they kind of went through a first filter to get to uh, NASA to be uh, have an option of being selected. So yeah. that was kind of the process. You went through a physical, uh, pretty extensive physical down at uh, the Brook Air Force uh, uh, facility in San Antonio. And there was a few days of uh, uh, call it writing x-rays, uh, uh, essay type things about space. And you went before a board 
of uh, people at uh, Houston mm-hmm. uh, at, for the final selection. And uh, th- then NASA made their choices, and w- that was announced at a later time. Mm-hmm. The uh, and this is just amazing what was going on during that time. You know, Kennedy prior had announced the space race. We're we're doing all these. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing all this stuff to get more and more people up on the moon. Um, and uh, at, at some time during this, I mean, are you are you under the understanding that when you transfer over that? Yeah, I want to go into space. I could be an astronaut, or did you did you have that vision yet? You were just kind of like, well, let's see how this turns out. No, no. The re- the reason I applied uh, for the astronaut program, I frankly I thought about it uh, quite a bit uh, and didn't apply it about a month before I could apply uh, because I was really enjoying what I was doing at Flight Research Center. I was flying almost every day, uh, flying uh, quite a different variety of aircraft. Uh, mm-hmm. involved in uh, at any given time maybe uh, in three test programs one where I'd be at the primary pilot others I might be just a uh, uh, one of the uh, support pilots like on the X-15 program chasing or checking the weather for their launch mm-hmm. uh, checking up uprange lake beds before the day before or so before the launch that they were all okay if they had to make an emergency landing and uh, maybe be a subject pilot on a different different kind of a uh, test program where they needed people to do evaluations. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was, you know, it was very interesting. It was, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of flying, good flying. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, I put this in the book. Uh, Neil Armstrong was ahead of me about three years. He he joined NASA at Lewis, and Neil went to Edwards Air Force Base. Now he got to fly the X-15, mm-hmm. and then uh, he went into the astronaut program, and he. He came back uh, to visit the Flight Research Center, which now is named Armstrong, incidentally, after Neil. And Don Malik and I, another research pilot there, talked to Neil. And uh, he asked him, well, what's, what's it like, Neil, being down there in Houston in the astronaut program? And he said, well, he said, you sit in a lot of meetings. <laughs> you sit in the simulator a lot. And you don't get much good flying. Hmm. Of course, he was addressing the kind of flying I was doing, and he had done when he was at the Flight Research Center with the variety of aircraft and variety of programs. And uh, it kind of set us back or set me back, thinking, well, do I really want to go down there to Houston with <laughs> Neil? And, uh, but uh, the more I thought about it uh, on two accounts, one is the premier program at, at, at uh, at the time for us at Flight Research Center was the X-15 program. And in our pilot's office, uh, when you might work your way to fly the X-15 depended on your seniority. Hmm. And I had about three people ahead of me in Mm -hmm. seniority. So I figured I'd probably never get to fly the X-15 before the program ended. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I looked on the other hand at the the, uh, evolving Apollo program and uh, it was going to take people to the moon and i thought well boy that'd be a pretty exciting adventure oh yeah so uh i decided that's uh, and that's what it was to me just a, it was you were just gonna go a little higher a little faster <laughs> and uh so i said well i i think i'll uh, sign up so i did and, and was chosen that would make a great name for a book, A Little Higher, A Little Faster. Just a little yeah. higher, just a little faster. Why did you choose the name of the title on your book? Uh, I mean, I think I know, might know why, but uh, I'd love to hear it from you. Never Panic Early. What what made you uh, cho- choose that title? Well, it's, it's kind of a, a, a thing that you come to uh, when you have problems. And even before mm-hmm. I was flying, I mean, it's, it's something people deal, deal with in everyday life with circumstances where they have a car wreck or they have an injury in the family. Uh, if you have something bad happen, uh, you got choices of what to do. You can uh, maybe maybe act too quickly and uh, do the wrong thing and make things a lot worse. Mm-hmm. Or you can hesitate and uh, look at the situation. In the case of an aircraft or a spacecraft, look at the data you have available on the instrument panel or uh, otherwise, and uh, logically think about what next to do to uh, help the situation or 
solve the situation. And so that's it's kind of a, a thing uh, people should address more and not, you know, like I say, not panic and in their haste do something that's uh, bad and actually worsens the situation. But stop a, stop a few seconds, maybe a, or a minute or so, and think about what, what should I really do uh, to, to better this situation. You know, and, and that's the that's the interesting thing about the field that you were in, and pilots and and astronauts, and and uh, you know they're they're trained to deal with uh, they train to deal with the emergency situations or when things go bad, and how not to lose your cool, and how to you know process. Okay, what are the steps that we need to do, and you know that enables people like uh, the Sully um, thing in New York, where uh, you know you had to land the plane very quickly and go through the process. Um, and a lot of times where, you know, you probably needed that sort of training when in the Apollo three, uh, or 13, uh, issue that took place. Yeah. We, we got a lot of that kind of training in a, a thing called, uh, uh, sessions called integrated simulations. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is where we, we were be in our primary simulators, which at the time were located at Kennedy space center. Uh, the, the capsule, uh, uh, command module and the landing craft uh, geometrically were exactly like the real vehicles. You laid in the couches and the uh, command module trainer. Although if we weren't wearing spacesuits, we ch cheated and used some cushions. <laughs> the couches were hard and uh, stood up in the lunar module and they, they uh, functioned through uh, computer emulation all the systems just like they would in uh, in reality uh, if the vehicle was operating you had all the right meter readings for whatever you were doing at the time you had a good reasonable visual out the window to see uh, earth horizon star field very accurate uh, that sort of thing but also within the uh, capability was the capability of uh, stimulating failures mm -hmm and uh, a large number and the command module simulator uh i think had a repertoire of uh, over 500. wow so, holy crap we call it credi credi credible system failures and the lunar module up so upwards are like 300. yeah now what the way these things were run was there was a behind the scenes a group called sim soup uh who was a group of people that knew the vehicles well the systems and they spent a lot of time thinking about for each of the runs we made, be they launches or entries or landing on the moon or going in and out of uh, lunar orbit, those sorts of things. They dreamt up the best uh, suite of failures to input and they selected the timing of when they would be input by the simulator operators uh, during our runs. Uh, and they, uh, they took great, glee and felt they had success <laughs> if they made us look bad and i say us uh the crew our mission control and handling these uh, problems that were uh, set up wow and we went through thousands of hours of this kind of training wow so you were pretty well steeped in feeling by the time you got to fly that well i, I probably can handle anything that's going to come up <laughs> there you go going through all this training and of course on board we had what we call malfunction procedures that for a given uh, warning light coming on you could grab the book and it was kind of like a yes no a logic trail you would follow in this diagram that could eventually if you didn't have it off the top of your head could could lead you to the, the resulting uh, problem of the cause of the light and mm -hmm. and what to do and imagine these these were super important after the loss of the crew of Apollo One. Uh, did had they predicted what ended up happening on a, the the flight of Apollo Thirteen? Uh, they they had uh, in, a, wow. in terms of the design uh, through uh, the whole design phase, uh, particularly led by reliability engineering. They do uh, what's called FEMAs, F M E A S, failure mean effects analysis on every valve failed open fail closed every wire shorted or open wow and every component uh like that and that influences the design along the way that might the, if the manifestation that's written as the result of the failure is too bad 
it might result in adding redundancy. I'm talking about very early in the design or adding a little, a little later on, it gets harder to add, start adding redundancy when you're getting ready to build it. But uh, telem more telemetry or uh, procedures that we say, well, we can work around it. So that's done and explosions were considered. Uh, primarily, I think the major culprit was thought to be prob probably rocket engines, mm -hmm. which had, had that occasion to happen a few times. Yeah. And uh, of course the cryogenics the same way, the oxygen, hydrogen, and uh, the manifestation of that kind of a failure happening, if you read the failure mean effects analysis, it would say you're gonna lose the vehicle and you'll lose the crew. No. Oh. So uh, the, the Apollo 13, uh, uh, we had an explosion just in one oxygen tank, tank two, and the, the uh, situation now was we were still alive. Uh, we, we, they, they, didn't, they didn't lose the crew. So we gave them a problem to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> if, not, if it had gone by the FEMAs, uh, we, they would have not had the problem. So the so the so they'd anticipate that you guys would have been lost by that uh, by that happening, right? Wow. Well, I'm glad you survived. Uh, it, you know, we we should probably note that as we talked in the green sh room, uh, right now, 52 years ago, you would be flying through the air and under that mission. Do you do you often think or uh, about how surreal that is when you go back? Do you go back and go, holy crap! Like I can't. I, I can't believe, you know, just think about that, of what, you know. No, you and, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel about it that way. <laughs> what I feel about it is uh, how much is still being uh, talked about and, and how much uh, many talks I give, I give to schools, uh, mm -hmm. give it to conventions, uh, you name it, any, any number of types, and uh, how interested people still are in that. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a folk tale, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm that uh, is in people's minds uh, an in interesting story and of course it, it had the virtue of a happy ending and uh so it's that, that's what's surprising to me that's 52 years a long time ago yeah people yeah. love a comeback story <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i think in the book uh you know there's there's been lots of movies and stuff written about it and of course hollywood has to take you know they always take some some umbrage of different things. Do you get to correct some of the things in the maybe that the movies uh, maybe got wrong? Uh, no, I, I had nothing to do with uh, the filming or the movie, actually, the, mm -hmm. the making of the movie. I did meet uh, one day, uh, I brought in lunch. I had an, I, I was running a subsidiary company, a Grumman Corporation at the time. Mm -hmm. I had a visit from Ron Howard, and he brought his uh, young daughter. And uh, Tom Hanks came and the producer, and I hosted them in an office I had down by Kennedy Space Center off site. And uh, they had a book and they sort of flipped the pages and went through. Uh, by that time, they had reviewed all the data NASA had given them, I guess the mission report. And I, I found out later that it actually gave them all the air to ground uh, that Ron claimed he listened to for the whole flight. And uh, they had li had a list of questions to ask me about things. I think kind of getting uh, maybe my reading a little bit between the lines because they also had Jim Lovell's book mm -hmm. that had been published at that time initially called Lost Moon. And I think on a reprint, they label it Apollo 13. But mm -hmm. at any rate, uh, I went through those uh, those questions with them. And a second visit was made by Ron with photographers uh, to look at the locations out at Kennedy they sort of had planned for certain uh, shoots. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought along Bill Paxton, who was going to play my role. And I uh, took Bill on kind of a tour of Kennedy, a blue, blue ribbon tour uh, that day. But uh, that, 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 this was months before they ever started filming. Mm -hmm. But once that happened, I, I was not involved. Uh, now, Jim uh, attended, I think, the set once or even twice. And they, they actually had him in the movie. He was the the captain, uh, Navy captain on the ship, uh, when uh, the movie actors were recovered uh, at the end of a Apollo 13 uh, story. Mm -hmm. Did they get it right in the movies? Was there anything maybe you covered in the book that uh, maybe they didn't get right? Well, the, uh, th the things they did was, I uh, call it some uh, exaggerations or drama that uh, really didn't happen. They had, 
Well, I, I was uh, space sick. Mm -hmm. I got too big a hurry after I got on, first on orbit. I had to gather film and cameras, uh, both movie camera, video cameras, the stills. And that, all of that uh, brackets to put in the windows to mount stuff. And they were all under the couch on the floor. And I had to rotate and I was rapidly doing that to gather all that equipment because I was anxious to be looking out the window and that <laughs> three times. And that, uh, people warned me that you, sh you should not move too fast for a while to get wow. gravity. And uh, I up Chuck, but it was like a spit up. I had a bag yeah. pocket we always carried. Uh, and I captured it, so I didn't mess up anything. And of course, they had uh, Bill Paxton uh, hack it up. It looked like a whole uh, uh, thing of uh, chocolate pudding uh, <laughs> in the movie. Sort of an exaggeration, but nevertheless, they had a crew argument that did not happen. Uh, yeah, Jack and I about stirring the cryos. If I had not been still putting away things from the TV show we had just staged. I would have been in the right couch position and I would have been the one to throw the switches, mm -hmm. Jack. And so you, there was no way of knowing that electric short was going to happen. Yeah. So they, you know, they had to add that in and they grossly exaggerated the manual maneuvers we did. We did two uh, maneuvers without a computer on the way home to change the trajectory a little bit, tweak it. And we didn't move more than a degree or two. Wow. And of course, in the one scene, they had the earth going up and down in the window like we were about <laughs> to lose control. Uh, I questioned Ron about that, uh, some of that, and uh, it was funny his answer. He said, and that's how I know, he, list he said, I listened to all the air to ground uh, transmissions. And he said, it never seemed to me like you ever had a problem. Wow. So I said, I said to humanize you in some way. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> that's why, why some of that was put in. Uh, yeah. It sounds I, like it's really overall, hit some... Overall, I think the movie uh, obviously told a great story of that. Yeah. We were in trouble. There's no question about it. Deep trouble. And it showed a team. Uh, not not uh, That's another drawback. There was not as big a team as really worked the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, much more than one shift of mission control. Gene Kranz's white team. And uh, to, to work at it, work the problems, many got less sleep on the ground talking to them afterwards than I got in flight and uh, came up with solutions that got us home. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, did, did ever during the whole experience you get worried, like, I don't think we're going to get out of this? Uh, it sounds like you guys were probably in more control of what was going on than what that was on the ground. We're like, we're fine up here. We'll, we'll make it. Well, we were fine in stages. Uh, yeah. Oh, I nobody, including Mission Control, knew the end uh, yet. It's, it's the same kind of work in increments, trying to just stay ahead mm -hmm. uh, and get to a better posture. Uh, that, that's what they initially did. Well, first of all, uh, get us pointed in the right direction <laughs> to even get back to Earth. Yeah. Then they did a second maneuver. They figured out uh, after passing the moon to cut some time off, so they mm -hmm. cut the corner. Uh, so to speak, and uh, bought 10 hours off the return, mainly to enable uh, be better to uh, have the power left in the batteries mm -hmm. and the water supply in the limb, which were both critical. Yeah. Uh, oxygen was not, incidentally. That was, uh, I think, uh, later I saw a news cast that they were really worried about oxygen. We had two full backpacks, you know, that we we're going to use when we landed on the moon. Oh. So full up, and they had a both had emergency bottles on them with very high pressure oxygen to, to take care of the hole in the suit. Mm -hmm. Possibly uh, 6,000 PSI. Each of those was about a day's work. Oh, so. Yeah, that we could have used through purge valve in the mm -hmm. suit. So we had lots of, I didn't even ever calculate that even when Jim asked me to look at consumables at one point. Did you ever, I mean, did it ever cross your mind thinking about maybe your life i don't know if you're married or had kids at the time or you know just thinking about it just uh, even a blip where you're like well what if this doesn't work out <laughs> no i you know you you never think about that uh uh normally before you leave it it's kind of a practice uh when i was in mil military squadrons uh you normally had a designee uh, not necessarily designated but it was obvious your best friend or who you were with in the squadron that was going to 
take care of the family and the wife if uh well, the administrative part of things if you didn't make it back one day and before apollo 13 uh, jerry carr lived around the corner from where i lived in a little community and he was a fellow marine uh active duty marine at the time and i asked jerry to uh as a as really a designee he said you're the point person to watch after the family if i don't get back wow he, he i had him at the house even uh show him where things might be he need to get at but again mostly administrator because obviously that, that when that happened as it happened on apollo one the family had a lot of support of other astronauts of other astronaut wives uh nasa protocol people so uh it was just he was kind of the lead person to make sure things got taken care of so you prepare ahead of time that you might not uh, might not get back. It's interesting the whole me uh, mental stoicism that you guys have and, and the preparedness. I guess a lot of it went into. Do you guys know how how glued America or the world was to their TV sets and cheering for you guys' return? And what was it like to come back and and be a hero? Well, I t tell you that was the one shocker uh, that I never thought about in joining the astronaut program was that. Uh, the public attention it really came to me. I was a backup on Apollo 8. Mm -hmm. First time we went to the moon, I was backed up uh, Bill Anders. And I was just in, in, amazed that uh, when I when they got back and I read it, started reading newspapers and looking at news and, <laughs> and then looking at the trip they had planned, uh, sort of around, not around the world, but a lot, a long, long set of visitations at different countries. I said, wow. I said, you know, when I flew test airplanes, I didn't get this kind of, <laughs> this kind of attention, uh, even with the X-15. I mean, it, it wasn't anywhere near the degree it was uh, in, in Apollo days. So it, that was a real shocker of, of sort of a part of the job uh, being an astronaut that I had not thought of uh, before I signed up uh, and became one. Mm -hmm. Was it fairly easy to adapt to the hero role when you came back where people were... You know, uh, it really, I mean, everybody knew your name. Everyone was watching the TVs. Everyone was like, you know, hoping that the, uh, that you guys would get back safely. Well, it was easy because, uh, you know, you were really telling the story you were living. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was e easy in that, that respect. I, I frankly, uh, my public speaking was limited to a class of, I did of that in junior college, uh, community college. And then uh, we did get a, what was called the week in the barrel, where you uh, became a, a rookie astronaut, where you were at the hands of headquarters NASA. They, they had prearranged a week full of events, mm -hmm. sometimes two a day, three a, three a day even, all kinds of events, it's visit schools, uh, have dinner, uh, banquet type events, whatever. So they, they wanted to get you exposed uh, rapid fire into being in the public, and to uh, speaking and, and of course speaking again was subject was easy it was in my case was to tell about the apollo program that i was hoping to uh join and, and be a part of and fly wow so uh you know what it wasn't uh what say wasn't as tough as a politician might have it and <laughs> what they might think, have to think about talking about so but they gave you at least that conditioning before later you ended up with some of your own uh different kinds, but later a uh, public events. What made you finally get it right uh, around to writing a book about your memoir? I mean, see, everybody seems to have written a book and, and, uh, well, I, I finally got, uh, what I called maybe more free time than I, <laughs> I had had, uh, cause I, I followed my 20 years in NASA. I was 17 years with aerospace companies, Grumman, uh, corporation. And then, uh, later North of Grumman. I ran space programs for Grumman for four years. Then I went off and formed a service company that wanted to get in the service business. And when Northrop and the Grumman emerged, I inherited their service company, which was doing similar type of government contracting. And so I ended up running uh, for 17 years, uh, those, uh, during those 17 years, two, two service companies. Mm -hmm. And I got, uh, retired then in 1996 and almost immediately went to work on the board of directors of uh, Infin uh, to build Infinity Science Center mm -hmm. a museum 
uh, in Mississippi, where I grew up, uh, actually right at the exit off of Interstate 10 that adjoins uh, the museum on the south side and the Mississippi State Welcome Center with Stena Space Center, which is the place where all the rocket engines are tested. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, uh, that was uh, we obviously had a challenge. Uh, it was a not-for-profit board formed that I joined with the uh, goal of raising initially $40 million. Wow. Because this was a museum built from scratch. NASA gave us uh, 18 acres of land on a 30-year land use agreement. And uh, from there on, it was up to us. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I spent a lot, a lot of time, and still do, and fundraising uh, for the for the museum uh, to because uh, it's, it's suffered uh, as most museums have badly through the COVID. Yeah, it's yeah. Fair drop in attendance uh, that's happened across the country. Uh, yeah, and all museums for the most part are not for profits, which is you know uh, always uh, hunting for money. And then you you eventually went on and played a key role in the space shuttle program. Well, that yeah, that was still with uh, uh, with with Grumman. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, we won a contract. Uh, actually, it was the first major contract for the service company that we had formed. Uh, and I was teamed with Lockheed was the prime contractor, and Thiokol and Grumman were the subs. And uh, so that contract uh, I was had for, uh, was involved with for twelve years. Mm -hmm. uh, turn, turning around space shuttles after they land from space and getting them ready for the next launch. Mm -hmm. uh, the other major contract uh, I was on for four years and actually left the company because it was set up as a separate uh, separate entity and for that contract was to uh, go to, I had to move to Washington and led the uh, system engineering integration contract on space station mm -hmm. in this case it was called space station freedom before it became later the iss and uh those were tough years that was a, probably the hardest uh job and contract i had and and uh, label at the end of that uh, segment of the chapter i call it my time in purgatory <laughs> <laughs> and, and mainly not the not the job itself which was interesting and fun even the restructuring we had to do but it was mainly the frustration with uh, uh, achieving and, and keeping congressional funding. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle every year through that those four years. Uh, in fact, one year, if one vote had changed in the House of Representatives, we would have no space station today. Wow. And wow. Uh, of course, it was a big morale issue with my, the workforce I had uh, reading that in the Washington Post and uh, the periodicals that integration offices I had at four NASA centers. Uh, on that contract, uh, I was afraid it's going to be losing the workers. I just, uh, in some cases, going all around the country to recruit. So that was a uh, that was a tough cut contract from a uh, job from that standpoint, more than the actual hands-on uh, work uh, trying to get the, uh, the space station uh, uh, ready to, uh, to get to eventually to build it. Yeah, I I grew up building Estes rockets and uh, I built the space shuttle. You know the little rocket versions of it. And I used to love shooting those off with my friends when I was eleven. And you know the whole dream of astronaut travel and space. Um, you know the ability for the space shuttle to return. You know and land like a plane uh, was really innovative to ch changing what was going on. Uh, I was really honored uh, years ago that uh, NASA. Brought me and a bunch of people to um, California, the California base there in the up in the desert, and we got to see the Endeavor land and go tour the um, the 747 that that carries it around. And we were literally within I don't know eight feet of being able to reach out and touch the space shuttle. It was just extraordinary, just to think about the journeys that thing had been on. Well, how do you how, what do you think about how the space shuttle program has evolved, where we now have these easily return landable things that that can come back and forth like spacex and stuff well uh, uh, obviously spacex has had tremendous success mm -hmm. they, they had some hard early years uh mm -hmm. like the first several launches and in fact i think uh the Bible had to throw in the towel uh, when they finally uh, got got uh, uh funding to continue and got a, a successful launch it's been very great ever since and that 
they've had a uh, uh, methodology of uh, return of the booster uh, uh, that has uh, lessened the cost considerably and reuse. Uh, like the, uh, I think the two the crews that have flown in the uh, capsule uh, equivalent, the Dragon, they reused it. It was the same vehicle they used again uh, for the next flight. So that added uh, something the shuttle didn't have was the uh, promise of, uh, let's say, not cheap, but uh, certainly a lot uh, cheaper uh, capability of uh, getting things up and down. Mm-hmm. Uh, the shuttle, that, that was the one promise that failed. It was uh, uh, really never never made it to uh, sort of being, being the low, low cost way of getting things up and down. It was a very uh, uh, innovative vehicle, though, in, in a sense you mentioned that they could carry things up. Uh, it could retrieve them if you wanted to bring them back home. It could get things and repair them uh, like they did uh, Space Telescope. So it has certain capabilities that we, we, have, we don't have with anything else we have yet today. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's lost, uh, that kind of capability. But it was a very expensive uh, system to operate, took a lot of manpower, uh, which is probably the biggest recurring cost uh, for mm-hmm. shuttle was the uh, uh, payroll, the labor force. Yeah, they just delivered two days ago the first, uh, SpaceX delivered the first uh, alt-private astronaut crew to the ISS exactly. station. Exactly, yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, and that's, uh, well, it's, it's, been, it's been so perfect. I mean, uh, you know, the, and hopefully they're not going to change anything. Uh-huh. Uh, cause they have a, you know, a, a, a sort of a singular mission. It's to go up rendezvous and dock with the space station and come back and do an Earth orbital reentry. If they don't mess with anything and try to make it better, like better software or something, uh, <laughs> mess something up, uh, it's obviously the reliability has been tremendous. As long as again, the only th- you know the only thing they face is failures potentially, like again, the rocket engines. Yeah. Uh, or the, the arc. The other one that gets you on a recurring thing like they're doing is complacency. Hmm. Complacency and the uh, preparation and uh, that that sort of thing that can happens in squadrons if you get uh, complacent you'll some somewhere you'll have a an accident a pilot error or wh- whatever be the cause that you can trace it back to that factor that mm-hmm. the uh and, and in your book you talk about an ex- a, another challenge that you go through where you uh end up you're you know you're do, i guess uh ferrying a world war ii air show uh aircraft uh, do you want to touch on that a little bit tease that out uh, yes, I, I was uh, involved with an operation that did air shows, uh, mm-hmm. and w- the opening act was uh, uh, the semblance of the attack on Pearl Harbor. We had some pyrotechnics in the center of the field that got set off, that kind of thing, and used airplanes that had been acquired very cheaply from 20th Century Fox. Uh, they had converted a number of aircraft to resemble uh, Japanese aircraft in making their movie, 20, uh, Toro, 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 The Attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, a very good movie, in fact. Yeah. And uh, so we just used them to stage that air show. And I really picked up the uh, VAL, uh, which was the code, the name for the Japanese dive bomber, which had uh, nice fancy uh, pants on the wheels and uh, different colleen on it to give that resemblance and a good paint job to look like the Japanese VAL. And we kept it at a crop nurses field and I was picked, picked it up to ferry it to Shoals field at Galveston, Texas, where we had a wash rack to clean it up because we had an air show coming up the following the weekend, uh, at Dallas Fort Worth area. And uh, I was too close on another airplane. I was flying formation on, uh, in fact, Ted Mendenhall, he was one of our shuttle training aircraft pilots. And I got too close on him, and I was afraid of running over him on the runway and uh, getting too close. And I did a go around, and about 300 foot in the air, the engine quit. Oh. And uh, by rapidly uh, changing, well, changing the tanks uh, to the other fuel tank, uh, and I had a hand wobble pump I could pump to get fuel pressure. Uh, I could get it to sputter, which enabled me to make a 180 degree turn away from the water because I was headed. Uh, landing south into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's, I knew it was shallow water. You don't want to land. This was a fixed gear airplane. I couldn't raise the gear. Yeah. 
and I knew I'd probably flip over and I'd end up upside down trapped in shallow water. So I welted along 180 degrees, but landed and it did not have any shock absorbing except the tires because the fancy pants they put on, they also bolted plates on the oleos so they could not strut us. Uh, oh, wow. Move to shock, give you some uh, landing uh, support. And uh, it, one, it, one, one landing gear came off on impact. It flipped, the wing dug in, and ended up going upside down backwards and trapped for a little while with it on fire. Fortunately, a nice blue flame, uh, not, not yet a lot of smoke with oil, which would be bad for breathing. Yeah. I managed to uh, kick a hole through the flimsy <laughs> canopy that was on those uh, World War II airplanes and got out. But in the meantime, I had uh, had fire. Uh, burn legs and arms and part of my rear end where I had to stick it in the fire and had burns over about 60, 65 percent, wow. half second, half third, and ended up three months in the uh, one week short of three months in the Galveston uh, University of Texas hospital and treated for at least a grafting by uh, shrine doctors. Uh, right next door was the Shrine Burn Institute and for children. And they also serviced the adult ward uh, and did mentoring for uh, uh, doctors, the University of Texas doctors who are budding to be maybe plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got that uh, support during my uh, stay in, in the, Ga the Galveston UT. University of Texas Hospital, and I was careful not to let any of the people know I went to the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. That's <laughs> hilarious. And you have a miraculous recovery from that. I mean, that's sixty-five percent of your body. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, at that day and age. This was seventy-three. Uh, that was uh, that was quite a high number for an uh, adult of my age, anyway. And the children, they were at that time, they were doing surviving at ninety, a little over ninety percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but at any rate. Uh, I met with the doctors early on after the first the first critical phase. They worry about if you breathe any hot gases that might have damaged your respiratory system, because if you've done that, uh, there's no recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got past that, and I talked to the internist and uh, Dr. Larson, who was the prime doctor from the Shrine Institute that was going to do the grafting work, and told him I wanted to get back to flight status. <laughs> And uh, so we talked over the, uh, what the protocol was going to be. And the one thing that looked like we should do something different was because I had burns all the way around the legs. Mm -hmm. I got the grafting. They don't want pressure on the grafts for five days. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to put a pins through the ankles and hoist my legs up in the air so there'd be no pressure on the legs yeah. during that period. And uh, we were then we were thought about, well, it might leave holes in the bones, that gap of some kind that might cause the problem flying again with pressure differential. Oh, yeah. Going up and down. So what I had, uh, the wife uh, bought a pair of sandals that could be easily strapped on my feet and uh, took them to uh, de deliver them to uh, crew systems uh, division at uh, Johnson Space Center. And uh, the suit techs actually uh, fixed a board with Velcro and glued on the bottom of the sandals matching Velcro. <laughs> that enabled me to clamp my feet into that board at the end of the bed and avoid the use of the pins. Wow. And so that's what one workaround we did. Otherwise, the, the other things done during that period were pretty much the standard that was done. The, the worst of all was getting dunked in a uh, diluted Clorox tank, oh. a tank every day. Oh, wow. Instead of preventing infection. Yeah, yeah. And you had to stay in there 17 minutes. They had a, they had a clock that sat on the wall. You could watch the 17 minutes go by. It seemed like pain got worse as it got longer you were in there. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. I, I, I burn when, you know, I put a little hydrogen peroxide on a hangnail. Right, yeah. That's that's the end of the world for me right there. Yeah. Uh, you're a tougher, you're a tough man. And uh, have you ever thought that maybe you got a little, uh, like, cat nine lives sort of thing going on there? 
Uh, well, I hadn't quite used all man of them yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got seven <laughs> left, but uh, you know, you've 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 had a couple close calls there, probably more than most people. Yes, I, I have, and I, I just feel very blessed to have uh, survived and uh, been able to continue the yeah. career, and uh, been lucky. I mean, it's lucky and blessed to have been able to do what I've done through my life. Uh, yeah. I, they, like I said, the only the only job that was uh, Unpleasant, as I mentioned, was that four years on the early space station, <laughs> and, ma and mainly it wasn't the job itself. It was the, the, the dealing with the congressional committees. Wow! And they weren't about the funding. Uh, in fact, uh, Proxmire at one time, I think zero NASA funding, it quickly got turned around. Yeah. And, uh, th those were uh, not good years. It seemed like the con Congress didn't uh, hear Greg uh, Reagan's message when he. He was the one that kicked off space station mm -hmm. and gave a nice talk about uh, the wonders of what this laboratory was going to do, but Congress wasn't listening. <laughs> yeah. Have you booked any flights for Mars? Uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk no, wants to go to Mars. <laughs> no, I, that's too long a trip. And, uh, even, <laughs> you know, that's a long, long trip. That's going to be a tough, tough thing to do from that aspect. And uh, I know uh, Elon's interested in having a, permanent establishment in the city logistic support unless you can get get through the early time to actually figure out how to live off of mars itself yeah that's going to be the difficult part that transition now that's one thing about going back to the moon and a moon base will be there'll be a lot of learning curve on that aspect uh what's what's the right architecture to provide the logistic support to uh, set up and maintain an operation uh, on the moon, which will be obviously from just the distance away, a lot easier uh, a task, a challenge to contemplate. Yeah, and and you guys never, you were never able to land on the moon in the subsequent missions you went on. You were supposed to be on the moon on, on Apollo thirteen. Do you ever? Does that ever bug you? You ever any regrets about that? Like, gosh darn it. Well, not today. It did for a number of years afterwards. I, yeah. I, I lost the chance on nineteen. I had uh, flown as a backup commander on uh, 16 to John Young, and that put me in the lineup to then uh, probably fly 19 uh, with uh, Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue, who were mm -hmm. assigned to me early on as the backup crew on 16. And uh, of course, they canceled it after about four or five months into that training cycle. Wow. And I lost that chance. So it bothered me for a couple of years that I never, never got the chance to try it again. Yeah. Well, you've lived a hell of a life. Anything more you want to tease out on the book for people to go out and buy it? Well, no, no it's, it's, it's a good story. I hope, uh, I hope beyond the book, uh, that people, uh, that are currently involved in the program, I mentioned several things that I hope they bothered looking up, uh, in the archives, like a fellow named Bill Tindall did a lot of the, uh, what we call data priority, uh, sessions to figure out how to do the Apollo lunar mission and uh, what, what are some of the challenges. And it's a lot of that data. I don't know that because uh, I've not been involved uh, technically uh, with NASA at the sum of some of that has uh, reviewed been reviewed and what they're putting together for Artemis going back to the moon. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be pretty interesting. So uh, I, I thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it, Fred. It's been an honor to have you on. I, like I said, I grew up uh, just with the whole space race and this whole space age, and so it was, it was really fun to have you with the, on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed thank you. about the old days. <laughs> thank you very much. You're an American treasure, my friend. Uh, to my audience, go pick up the book. You can order it wherever fine books are sold. Never panic early. And Apollo 13's extraordinary uh, astronaut's journey. Extraordinary is one thing I added to that title. Um, so uh, go pick up the book and check it out today and read more about Fred's extraordinary life. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there as well. Thanks for being here. Stay safe. Be good to each other. And we'll see you guys next time. All right.